2022 marks the 10 year anniversary of a film that revolutionized the teen film market, bringing a grittier and fresh feel to audiences. The Hunger Games was an instant smash hit and launched the young adult dystopia genre, the next best thing to fill the void left by Twilight and Harry Potter, into a worldwide phenomenon. A surge of book-to-film adaptations followed and cemented the YA dystopia genre as one to stay. But first, what ingredients are needed to make a YA dystopian film? Well, here are some of the quick-fire rules of the genre. You need a quirky concept. Kids killing kids, or what if everyone had only one personality type? There must be a chosen one who is in some way better than everyone else, yet still one of the people. The government must be bad, like really bad, and most likely a totalitarian state. Parents are rarely present or dead. Some kind of love story, preferably a love triangle. Oh, and an A-lister actor playing the villain. We may joke about it, but you'll be hard-pressed not to find someone who looks back at the genre without that feeling of nostalgia and longing for a simpler time. So it's baffling to think that a genre with so much potential, which grew so rapidly, just imploded and died seemingly overnight. What went wrong? How did the social climate, commercial failures, social media and fandom and much more contribute to the rise and ultimate fall of a generation-defining genre? And was it always doomed to fail? It's a fascinating era of pop culture over the last decade, which we can't wait to dive into together. This is YA Dystopia. Were the odds ever in your favour? Hello everyone and welcome to this event as part of the LFF for Free programme at this year's 66th BFI London Film Festival in partnership with American Express. My name is Nick Willis. I'm Matilde Gimenez. And we are the two BFI Film Academy Young Programmers who curated this event. We promise we're about to get started in a few moments, but first we just want to quickly explain how everything's going to run. Like any good YA dystopian franchise, we split this event into four sections, giving them each short catchy titles, starting with the word the. The rise. The surge. The fall. And the future. This event blends video essays with talking head interviews from content creators you might recognise from YouTube, Instagram or TikTok. Jackie Todd. Nelly Karengo. And Tyler Warwick. They have brought a very unique and insightful perspective to this event, so we really hope you enjoy it. But that's enough talk. Let's dive right in. Picture this. It's 2012. Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe is blasting on the radio, the London Olympics are on the telly, Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2 is released, marking the end of another iconic franchise, and everyone is dancing to Gangnam Style. What a time to be alive. So, when the trailer drops for a film adaptation of the mega successful book series The Hunger Games, starring newcomer but recent Oscar nominee Jennifer Lawrence and Josh Hutchinson, the boy from one of the saddest kids' films ever, we knew we were going to be in for a great ride. I believe it was towards the end of 2011 that all of the trailers started to get released. Lionsgate was building more and more of the sort of um, the rise around what this genre was going to be. Um, and it really, really bred this culture of obsession um, I remember being on Tumblr and Lionsgate would release one still image and these blogs on Tumblr would analyze it and they would create threads of saying, what do you think this is? What do you think this one costume element was? And it, yeah, just really, really built this obsession around the Hunger Games that I think that when it finally came to the point of it being released, there was so much anticipation, almost a year of anticipation for it. Um, so I think that sites like Tumblr, YouTube and Facebook were a huge reason why um, Hunger Games was so successful when it came out. In case you've been living under a rock for the last decade, here's a quick rundown of the film's plot. Based on Suzanne Collins' 2008 best-selling novel, The Hunger Games, 
which had sold over 17.5 million copies by the time the film was released, making her the first children's author to have sold over a million ebooks on a Kindle. The story takes place in a dystopian America known as Panem, which is split into 12 districts and the capital. Every year, The Hunger Games takes place, a televised competition where a boy and girl from each district are put into an arena and must fight to the death until one victor remains. 16-year-old Katniss Everdeen from District 12, the poorest of the districts, volunteers for her younger sister when she is reaped for the games. Katniss and the male tribute from her district, Peter Malark, are thrust into the limelight and must travel to the capital to train for the games and fight for their lives. For example, take the theme of the chosen one. In a lot of the other themes, the protagonist is often revealed to be the chosen one, but doesn't really usually do anything to merit it. They just sort of are just special. Um, they're just sort of born with it. Um, whereas in The Hunger Games, the franchise sort of turns that theme on its head. Like Katniss isn't really a chosen one per se. She volunteers in the event that her sister gets unluckily chosen. Like Katniss is simply a victim of circumstance, which is much more realistic and adds more depth to the story because it speaks to how circumstances in the real world are often one of the big reasons a person finds themselves in certain positions, not just because they're a special chosen one per se. The film rights were acquired by Lionsgate in 2009, and after much development, they began filming in May 2011 in North Carolina. And the film was then released in March 2012 to critical and commercial acclaim. Its opening weekend gross was the third largest of any film in North America at the time, and the second novel in the series, Catching Fire, had already been greenlit for an adaptation whilst filming the first. Fans and critics praised the film for its acting, tone, and gritty themes. Its dark subject matter felt fresh and unlike anything else we'd seen in the mainstream YA genre. Sure, there were elements of this in other films before it, but The Hunger Games unapologetically explored these mature themes in a fascinating way. I do think that um, The Hunger Games' mature themes, along with its general tone and language, are a part of what made it so appealing to young audiences. Um, despite being children such young adult media, The Hunger Games really takes its viewer very seriously. Um, it believes its viewer to be very intelligent. It doesn't dumb things down. It doesn't really sugarcoat things. Um, it treats its young viewers like they're capable of understanding a lot, which they are. It treats them less like children and more like um, adults, more like equals. Many fans took to the internet to talk about the film, with a lot of buzz being generated on Twitter, Tumblr and Instagram, all of which were still in their infancy as social media platforms. This was also fueled by numerous cast interviews which went very viral by 2012 standards. I think that with anything, if you want youth to be interested in it, you need to go where they are, which is social media. And the platforms have changed over time, but that's kind of been a constant thing. And in 2012 and around that time when The Hunger Games was just coming out, um, that was kind of like the infancy of social media and that was the first place that we had that was purely ours um, that we could share the movies that we were watching the shows we were watching the books that we were reading and before that it was kind of brands telling us what it is that we should be watching and that was the first time that we could tell our friends and i think that you're more likely to watch something if your friends say that it's good rather than just a brand telling you to watch something trying to sell it and so I think that social media had a huge impact at that time because we kind of felt like we had control over something. And that was sort of before a lot of content creators were being paid to then recommend different shows and different movies. So there was just a lot more authenticity to it. So I do think that at that time, social media was really, really big in terms of promoting The Hunger Games and other movies like it. Unfortunately, it wasn't all positive when there was an online backlash with black actors being cast as District 11's tributes Rue and Thresh. Despite both characters being described as having dark skin in the books, this didn't stop the onslaught of racist tweets and posts. With some going as far as saying the fact Rue was black made her death less sad. The disgusting idiocracy on display here just proved the necessity of a film which highlights a plethora of societal issues like race, class and gender inequality. 
It's even more pertinent now, in 2022, when we look back with the likes of the Black Lives Matter movement, which have shown us the way in which children of colour's deaths in particular are treated in the media and court of public opinion. However, the majority of fans had nothing but love and support for a film which was about to launch a worldwide phenomenon, which no one could have quite seen coming. Just one year after the release of The Hunger Games, the much-anticipated sequel Catching Fire, based on the 2009 novel, roared into the scene to much love and attention. The second film is the most successful film in the franchise commercially, grossing a staggering 865 million worldwide, making it Lionsgate's most successful film to date. I remember at the time there was a lot of like fan fictions. Um, this is when people were really putting, started to put themselves into the stories. Um, I remember reading lots of examples of people were having dreams that they were in the Hunger Games nightly. They were having nightmares and then I guess waking up and thinking, if I were Katniss, what would I be doing? Um, I remember I was at high school at the time and everyone started buying the Hunger Games merch. Everyone was wearing the little Mockingjay pins. The film was widely considered an improvement on the first, living up to all that a sequel should be. It took the concept of the first film and advanced it, bringing in more complex themes and introducing new fan-favorite characters such as Finnick O'Dare, played by Sam Cafflin, and Joanna Mason, played by Jenna Malone. The film had almost doubled the budget of the first, which was definitely on show in its impressive cinematography, production design and costuming. People really loved the film and couldn't wait for the final installments. After all, the decision to split the final novel, Mockingjay, into two parts had been announced shortly after the release of the first film in 2012. With The Hunger Games specifically, the books had already all been released before the films were made. Um, so I think in reality, you had the people who, you know, had already read the books and knew everything about it and then were looking forward to the films to see what the adaptation would be. And then there was this whole other group of people who had never read the books, but there was so much hype around the film that they were getting obsessed with the story to, from a perspective of having no idea what was going to happen. 2013 also saw the release of YA Dystopias, Ender's Game and The Host, both of which performed fairly poorly at the box office and weren't received very well. Surprising, since the latter was adapted from a 2008 novel by none other than Twilight creator herself, Stephanie Meyer. But then, 2014 came into the picture and can be fairly unanimously crowned the year of YA dystopia. The Hunger Games returned with its third installment, Mockingjay Part 1, which was a pretty solid entry to the franchise. One of the original YA dystopian novels, The Giver, by Louis Lorry from 1993, was given an on-screen adaptation starring the one and only Meryl Streep. And then two new kids on the block came to town. The Maze Runner and Divergent were released, and they became the closest anyone was going to get to encapsulating the lucrative Hunger Games franchise success. Another thing about The Hunger Games and Divergent and all of the other films that kind of fell into that YA dystopia genre, it kind of affects everyone. Um, with something like, I'm going to use Twilight as an example, uh, it's a mostly a female audience, I would say, for the most part. But something like Hunger Games, anyone can identify with that. It can be all genders, anyone can be interested in that and find characters that they like in it because there are a lot of um, a lot of different main characters that you can become interested in. And um, it has the romance, it has the violence, it has all aspects that people can find something that they like within that. So I do like that about the genre and that's why I do think that the genre will never die because it does interest, there's something for everyone in it. The Maze Runner, based on the 2009 novel by James Dasner, starred Teen Wolf's Dylan O'Brien and Skin's Caius Caudelario and followed a group of boys and one girl trapped in the middle of a giant maze with no memory as to how they got there or how to get out. The film was praised for its tone, acting and originality. It stood out in the sea of other films within the genre. Big tick there. Divergent, based on the 2011 novel by Veronica Roth, who, side note, wrote the book in three weeks over her winter break at uni and had sold film rights for the book before she even graduated. 
The film stars Shailene Woodley as Tris Pryor, who lives in a dystopian Chicago where everyone is split into five factions depending on their personality traits. The film was less successful than The Maze Runner and The Hunger Games, both commercially and critically, citing it as not hugely original despite the praise for Woodley's performance. Interestingly, at the time there was a bleed into TV with Cass Morgan's 2013 novel The 100 being adapted into a series on The CW. The show ran for 100 episodes over seven series from 2014 until 2020, and whilst viewership steadily declined as the series went on, the series maintained a positive reception until the end, rare for content within this genre. However, back to 2014. Now that the foundations were set for two more YA dystopia franchises to succeed The Hunger Games, what could possibly go wrong? Quite a lot, in fact. 2015 could be considered the year of the sequels. The Maze Runner Scorch Trials was released and continued right on from where the first film left off. The film had mixed reviews, mainly because of its deviation from the source material and bizarre story choices. The film introduces a zombie-like element to the genre, which, granted, was something different, but it did feel quite far removed from the Maze storyline in the original. Nonetheless, the film was cited as a commercial success, grossing 312 million worldwide. Divergent sequel Insurgent also had some mixed reviews. Some considered it an improvement on the original, although many were starting to tire of the imitative nature of the franchise. Although box office earnings of 297 million worldwide proved that it was technically a success. I actually recently watched the Divergent series again, and I hadn't watched it in a long time. We start with this character, Beatrice, who Again, very relatable, quite a simple situation. And then as it goes on, it just becomes so, so complex. There are suddenly all of these situations, there are different characters. And I think more and more people just saw themselves less in the characters than maybe they initially did. And then the time had come for the final chapter of the franchise, which started it all. The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2 closed the year out with a pretty big bang. Despite being the lowest grossing film in the franchise, fans and critics still applauded the action sequences, score and performances. After all, we'd been on a journey with these characters for the last four years, so it was satisfying to see their stories come to a close. However, the biggest issue was the decision to split the final book into two films, like Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows and Twilight Breaking Dawn, our favourite YA dystopia franchise took the least amount of money of the three, grossing over 1.4 billion worldwide for the final two instalments, compared to the other films 2.3 billion and 1.5 billion respectively. It's still an insane amount of money though. The pacing was a big criticism of Mockingjay Part 1 and Part 2, and so perhaps if there were one film like the novel Envisions, then this ever-present feeling of things being strung out in the genre might have been less present. After all, if one film changes direction, it's sure to make others follow suit. Ultimately, everything happened so quickly. Sequels were being churned out left and right and center yearly, and the market started to feel oversaturated. When this happens, people are more critical of the films that are being released, being able to easily compare them with each other. The lack of originality or copycat behavior quickly became quite apparent. Whereas if the film's releases were more spread out, there'd be less competition for each film to stand out and have to be completely unique. It would then mean that there would be time between the installments for the hype to build, but this was not the case and the fast-paced nature was not going to be sustainable for much longer. By the time 2016 rolled around, the OG film franchise had come to an end, and so it was going to take something new and exciting to keep the genre alive. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Like, at all. Fellow YA dystopia big shot franchise The Divergent series saw the final book be adapted into, you guessed it, two final films. They might not have quite known it yet, but this might as well have been the kiss of death for the YA dystopia genre. The first part, titled Allegiant, was released in March 2016 to a pretty awful reception. Commercially, the film was a box office bomb, grossing just $172 million against its estimated $110 to $142 million budget, the lowest of the franchise. 
At this point, when originality was what the genre was craving, Allegiant served us lukewarm character development and a logical plot which varied drastically from the novel in which it was based on. Rather quickly, plans for the fourth film were cancelled, and instead it was proposed the final film would play out as a TV movie, introducing new characters which would set up a spin-off TV series that expands beyond the books. But people were mad. Most notably the cast themselves, with Shailene Woodley herself deciding to exit the franchise, saying that she didn't sign up to be in a television show. After some determination to keep the projects afloat, execs cancelled the plans, leaving the Divergent series unfinished. Most likely forever. You'd think this might have sent somewhat of a message that perhaps the genre wasn't the same as it was back in 2014, but nope. People were determined to capture that initial Hunger Games magic. I think a lot of the other films that did come after the Hunger Games did do a disservice to the genre in the way that they seemed to recycle the same blueprint dystopian material but with less depth. Now they all had similar themes such as the chosen one and the love triangle um, and they would do them to death and it became increasingly difficult to decipher as much or any meaning from them as one was able to with the Hunger Games. And so I do think that many did distort the initial magic captured by the Hunger Games in the way that they removed a lot of the uniqueness and depth from the themes. 2016 also saw the release of The Fifth Wave, a film based on the novel of the same name by Rick Yancey, which was an alien take on the genre. The film was panned, with specific criticism aimed at the CGI and screenplay, which felt as if it was a patchwork creation of different YA dystopian films before it. Plans for future series adaptations were cancelled and there was yet another unfinished franchise. Whilst these examples of bad choices were made within the film genre's bubble, it's important to acknowledge the global societal change at the time which most definitely had an impact on the genre's demise. 2016 saw the quite shocking American presidential election with Donald Trump winning and serving for the next term. In the UK we had the Brexit referendum with the decision to leave the European Union and there were some quite frightening nuclear missile tests happening in North Korea. And even since then, with each year, the doom cloud seems to get lower and lower. Perhaps interest in the genre dwindled because it was beginning to feel like we were living in a dystopian society ourselves. Because even though it wasn't that long ago, so much has happened between then and now. It's a, quite a different world than it was a decade ago, politically, socially, technologically. And even though you wouldn't describe the films of this particular genre as comforting, I think the emotions that young people associate with them very much are. And many describe the present feeling as feeling like somewhat of a dystopia, living in some, somewhat of a dystopia. And so although it seems odd to want to consume dystopian media when you feel like you're living in one, watching these films for the fan bases may take them back to a time where they felt safer when the only dystopia was one on the screen and not around them in their lives and in society. The Cambridge Dictionary defines a dystopia as a very bad or unfair society in which there is a lot of suffering. I mean, sounds quite familiar, right? Gone were those nostalgic feel-good days of 2012. And obviously the world was by no means perfect then, but the young fans' perception of such was very real with those rose-tinted glasses gradually fading with age. I think as far as how the theme's perception as the audience got older, I would say for fans such as myself, if anything, we've come to realize that themes were so much more mature and deeper than we initially thought. They were deep then, but now with the added knowledge and wisdom and maturity that comes with age, we see so much further into them. Um, one example I can give is the love triangle. Um, the love triangle that is in The Hunger Games is not just a love triangle for the sake of being so or for the sake of drama. It is there to represent the two alternative ways that Katniss could choose to, to um, how to go about the rebellion. Um, so choosing Gale would represent the fight fire with fire route per se. You know, the doing whatever you must despite the cost. And it ended up costing a lot. It ended up costing Katniss, Katniss' sister and many other innocent people their lives. Um, PETA, on the other hand, represented the more altruistic side, um, holding onto your values and refusing to play the game of the oppressor in order to avoid becoming uh, just like the oppressor yourself. 
Not to mention, social media was rapidly growing in the mid-2010s, and a lot of correlations have been made with these platforms causing children to mature much quicker. A, bi a big theme about these films was the technology and the, um, the fact, you know, there was always this concept of being tracked, um, having these, you know, trackers injected into you or um, having, yeah, this sort of scrut this really, really high level of scrutiny. Um, in The Hunger Games, there was the concept of, you know, everywhere you turned, there were the screens playing The Hunger Games. And I do think that at the time, that was a very dystopian concept. But even 10 years later, that, that element is seen in a completely different way because, as we were saying, we do now have screens everywhere that have access to everything. Um, we all have smartphones that are constantly tracking us. And so I do think that there are definitely those elements that were less relatable before and maybe made us feel, you know, again, yeah, a bit of escapism um, that now in our world is like, I, I can definitely imagine younger people watching that and being like, oh, we're, this is this is our lives. I mean, the screens may not be showing kids fighting to the death, but um, the access to the screens and that concept of being constantly tracked. I mean, now there are all the the apps where, you know, parents are constantly tracking their kids and are able to just pull up their phone and see the GPS of where their child is. Maybe it became less, it became more relatable, which is actually not what you want. When you are watching films about a dystopian society. Perhaps young fans were starting to wake up more to what was happening in the world and these dystopian movies were no longer a form of escapism and rather a slightly too close to home reflection of our current society. None of this stopped the film industry from trying though. In 2018, the next attempt was made and The Darkest Minds, based on the 2012 novel of the same name by Alexandra Bracken, was released. This time, it was an X-Men spin on the genre. You can probably sense a pattern, but the film was not well received. The Rotten Tomatoes critics' consensus for the film sums it up perfectly with the phrase, dystopian deja vu. Although it should be noted that this is the first film we've spoken about that has been directed by a woman and person of colour, Jennifer U. Nelson. But unfortunately, people thought the film lacked originality and it was another franchise doomed to the movie graveyard. Also in 2018, we received the final film in the Maze Runner series. The Death Cure was to close one of the genre's heavyweight franchises and, unlike those before it, they were making just the one film from the final book. Finally, a lesson learned. Responses were mixed, but the consensus was that it was okay. Nothing special, and the further the franchise went on, the less closely they followed the books, so the audience of the film were mainly devoted book fans clinging on and wanting that closure. It didn't help that it had also been three years since its predecessor, due to lead actor Dylan O'Brien enduring a pretty severe injury on set delaying production. It felt as if people had kind of moved on in that hiatus, as evident by the reception of other films in the genre. We could go on with various examples of the genre's fall, but we will end on this one as it seems fitting. Just last year, in 2021, Lionsgate distributed the Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley-led film Chaos Walking, based on the first novel in the Chaos Walking series by Patrick Ness, The Knife of Never Letting Go. As you might expect, the film was a box office bomb, but like, ten times worse grossing a measly $27 million worldwide against a budget of $100 million. It is worth noting that this may have been affected by the pandemic, but it is still quite shocking when you compare it with Lionsgate's figures for The Hunger Games a decade earlier. If that isn't enough evidence for a failed genre, I don't know what is. Over the past couple of years, something really interesting has happened. The genre has had a kind of renaissance with the increased popularity of parody and fan edit short form content on platforms such as TikTok and Instagram. I started making parody videos in 2020, the very beginning of 2020. At that time, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff on TikTok regarding that. It was still a lot of dance videos. Nowadays, there is a ton of it. There are so many parody videos and everybody 
loves it. When I first started making them though, um, I didn't mean for them to be comedy. I just was so desperate to be cast in that kind of movie <laughs> that I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna make it myself. <laughs> And it actually started um, to become comedic because I was like, you know, my main character needs weapons, but I don't have any weapons. So I would just like tape a butter knife and like a potato masher to my chest and call it a day. Um, so it just became comedy from there. But it actually came from a p place of just loving the genre and wanting to create something. And one of the biggest uh, comments that I always got was people saying, I would 100% watch this unironically. So I think that I think that a lot of people feel the same. It's we poke fun at genres that we like, but it doesn't mean that we dislike them. It just means that we're craving that kind of content and we we don't have anything in the media for us now, so we just have to create it ourselves. So um I I think that actually the parody videos are are keeping the genre alive if anything because because it's giving us what we don't really have in mainstream media. Content creators like myself who are now creating this sort of parody content, again, from a place of love and uh, a sense of nostalgia from that time, are having success with that for that reason, because it does, people see a Hunger Games parody video and it feels like a lifetime ago that those uh, movies were in our lives and that they were relevant. This recent new wave of nostalgia might as well have been attributed to the isolatory pandemic when many people revisited comfort books and films from their childhood and adolescence. 100% whatever was big in media when you were young, that's something that you're going to cling to. So in the 2000, like 2012, kind of that era when Hunger Games was out, that was a big one. Twilight was big and you can see Twilight is huge on TikTok. The amount of videos, the amount of people that are all of a sudden watching Twilight again is massive. And it's because that's what everyone had. So it does have that nostalgic factor to it. So in my generation, it was Harry Potter. Um, and I think a lot of millennials get made fun of for that, this obsession with Harry Potter, but it's going to be the exact same thing with Hunger Games and Divergent and Twilight. Um, it's just gonna ramp up even more. Even if it dips and falls, I think that's always going to be a big nostalgic factor for people. This content is amassing millions of likes and views, so does it not indicate that an audience is still there, ready for a comeback to the movies? I think it's always going to have a comeback. I think that trends come and go, and I don't think that YA dystopian genre has necessarily gone. I think it's kind of lying dormant, because I do think that we all have um, multiple different genres that we're interested in. And right now, fantasy is really big online, especially on TikTok, like the House of Dragon that just came out and the new Lord of the Rings. And so right now that's where everything's focused. So my interest is focused there. But as soon as the Hunger Games comes out, I will be there. I will be there in a second. And I know that other YA dystopia fans are going to feel the same way as well. Um, I suspect that the genre is going to have a full resurgence in like seven to ten years because i think at that point we're all going to be more nostalgic about the pandemic and lockdown which has such a big influence on us but right now it's just like it's a little bit too close to home we're not far enough away from that but in like seven to ten years we're going to get nostalgic about it and i do think that the genre is going to take a kind of technical um focus so something like maybe black mirror but ya I think it's going to go in that direction because we were so focused on technology during the pandemic and it became such a big focus. So that's where I see it kind of going. But I do think that for the next number of years, we're still going to live in kind of fantasy land because we just need that escape after everything that's happened. Although it's not going to be that simple. We are currently living in an era of reboots, remakes and sequels, the novelty of which has already rubbed off on filmgoers. It's a tough crowd to impress if you're thinking of reinvigorating an entire genre that grew very tired very quickly. However, there's potentially one film that could do it. In April 2020, Lionsgate confirmed that plans were underway to adapt Susan Collins' Hunger Games prequel novel, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, which released the same year. The fact that this prequel book was released during the pandemic most likely contributed to the genre's digital renaissance. 
The story follows the infamous President Snow as a young man and a mentor to District 12 female tribute Lucy Grade Baird at the 10th annual Hunger Games. The two leads are played by Tom Blythe and West Side Story breakout star Rachel Zegler. They are joined by the likes of Euphoria's Hunter Schaefer, Game of Thrones' Peter Dinklage and acting royalty Viola Davis. The core team behind the franchise's most successful film, Catching Fire, are behind the prequel, which is very promising indeed. It bears well that we will be returning to the games itself, the main selling point of the franchise to begin with, which hasn't been done since Catching Fire in 2013. This will no doubt work in its favour if done in a creative and innovative way. At the time of filming this event in September 2022, the film is slated for a release on 17th of November 2023. Whether the film lives up to the hype, we will have to see. And will it cause a spark like the predecessors did over a decade ago? Honestly, I don't know. I think it's a little early to say, but I think it will be popular amongst the fan base. Whether or not I think it will be popular amongst general audiences yet, I think it might be too soon to tell until a actual trailer comes out and we see how that's well received, if that makes sense. But I definitely think that there is potential uh, because I think maybe there is an ache for that nostalgia again. So there we have it, a fairly comprehensive chronology of the rise and fall of the genre that defined a generation. But we do have one more question for our interviewees. I think the odds were in the genre's favour. I think what they built 10 years ago was something really, really strong, meaningful, and that it was right for them to be doing that genre. But yes, as always, maybe the um, execution of it was not as successful as it could have been, but I think that it had a really strong start. I think just by the nature of corporate Hollywood greed, you know, the incentive to make money above all else, um, I think the genre was doomed to be victim to just being very oversaturated to sort of following um, the successful, like the, the success of Blueprint, to being overly pushed on audiences, to having rushed production, all for the sake of just being able to ride um, the wave and making as much money in as little time as possible. Um, so I would say, yeah, due to, due to corporate greed, I would say for that reason, I think it was doomed to begin with. I don't think that it failed. I think, like I said, it's lying dormant and it's, it's always there. People are always interested in it. Even before the Hunger Games, it's always been a genre that people have been interested in. You even look in the eighties, um, there's been, there's a lot of stories that are, um, that are dystopian. We love it. It's always going to come back trends come and go but um it's something that it's just going to make its rounds again at some point in the future so um the odds are in its favor i would say it's clearly a complex discussion that walks the line between what we know factually happened and our emotional responses in spite of that it's evident that the studios behind the ya dystopian genre were fueled by monetary motivation rather than fan service due to the increasingly unoriginal stories that mimicked each other which wasn't helped by the rapid turnaround time on these films, leaving no real time for fans to build hype in between instalments and less time for studios to focus on story, often technically dooming these films to failure before they've even started. However, the legacy of these films is what continues on today through fan edits and short form video content on social media platforms, so it could be argued that the genre never really died and the passion and love for it still lives on. And who knows? Maybe this time next year we'll be walking into the cinema and see that initial Hunger Games magic recaptured on screen after 10 years and witness the beginning of the true redefinition of a genre. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Although one thing is for sure, putting aside all of the critical and commercial downfalls of the genre, these deeply special films have touched the lives of many young people around the world. And whilst they may not be the best films ever made, they definitely revolutionised the industry at the time and helped shape what it is today. And we're positive that they will continue to be a reminder of people's childhoods and a source of great nostalgia for many, many more years to come. 
We really appreciate you taking the time to join us in YA Dystopia. Were the odds ever in your favour? We would love to hear your thoughts on everything we've discussed in the comments below. Would you say the genre really failed, or is it just waiting for the perfect moment for its comeback? And who knows, we might just see you here again in another 10 years with more exciting twists and turns in the pop culture phenomenon that is the YA dystopian genre.